Hello friends and foes of Middle-earth and welcome back. Let's break down episode 4 of the Rings of Power. This episode was by far the best in my opinion. That's not saying much though. I can't believe we are halfway through season 1 and I feel so little has happened. The story is going to be hard to follow for the people that wasn't totally hooked during the first three episodes. But if people manage to get through those, I'd say this is one of the better episodes. Oh yeah, and we are very lucky that the Harfords are not in this episode. So that alone improves it slightly. But let's jump right into it. We start in Numenor where Queen Regent Muriel is blessing some children. The dialogue is a bit clunky and just states what's obvious to those in the scene. This also means it's just written for us, the audience. And it's an issue repeated a lot in this show. Muriel's dream is about Numenor sinking. While this didn't happen in the book, I actually think it's a fine way to foreshadow something that will happen later on. I'm a bit uncertain how common the story is about the fall of Numenor, at least to non-Tolkien fans. I'm certain pretty much any Tolkien fan know that Numenor will sink. But maybe it should have been a bit more subtle, so it's an actual surprise later on. I mean, after all, we're going to watch five seasons. And I guess the sinking of Numenor first happens in season four. Or maybe even in season five. So... There's a long wait for it. Several years, actually. Still, I don't mind the dream foreshadowing what might happen. One final note, though. If this is how it's meant to go down, the Tree of Nimloth should be gone, as Sauron manipulated Farazhan to cut it down. So it was actually gone by the time Numenor sank. But this is a dream, so we need to keep that in mind. Then we get to meet Kemen, the made-up son for Chancellor Farazhan. We get some more clunky dialogue where Farrison says he would rather have Kevin was wise than clever. I will say though that Farrison is right that ruling is about attending small matters as well. It's not like Farrison is doing anything in this scene that actually proves his point, but at least I agree with him. And then we get to the plaza in the capital. This guy, Tamar, was apparently not killed by Halbrand in the last episode, as I had thought. He holds a very xenophobic speech about elves, who he clearly hates. It's very obvious that it has some political undertones. I must say it also seems a bit of an overreaction. I mean, just one elf came to Numenor and suddenly he makes it sound like thousands of them are planning to move there. The crowd goes wild and starts screaming elf lover. I'm not a fan of that. It sounds a bit silly to me, but all right then. Barrison shows up and I will say Tristan Gravel acts quite fine in this scene. The speech is a bit meh and I find it quite weird that he hands out drinks to everyone near the end. I think that was one of the more off-putting things in this episode, but more will come later. It just feels very unnatural in some way. Also, were these women just standing around with wine? Feels off. I understand that they want him to look popular among the common people, but I think it should have been done in a better way. Let's move on. We discover that Kemen seems to have a thing for Earian. They're both non-canonical, of course, so they can do whatever they like, I guess. I sort of like Earian. I'm a bit curious what they will do with her character. Kimmon, on the other hand, I still firmly believe he will become a Nazgul. And the description on Amazon of his character just seems to confirm this suspicion. And then we have this scene with Galadriel, Muriel and Elendil. Galadriel is still super annoying. And at this point, I think she's worse than Rey. I feel it's a bit weird that Galadriel is accused of stealing the scroll. When in fact it was just given to them. And Elendil just stand around there saying nothing. Anyway... Galadriel says that the elves and Numenor should be allies. She wouldn't have the authority, even if she was a commander, I think. There's a bit of humor and Lloyd Owen's charming performance as Elendil at least made me smile. Of course he's not a petty lord, law-wise, but still. Muriel doesn't really want to help Galadriel, and then she gets really annoyed. Yeah, she closes her eyes very slowly, like a Karen about to explode. And then she screams that there's a tempest in her. God, the dialogue in this show is next level cringe. <sighs> it's really, really bad at times. And I honestly wonder how many people actually read this script and just approved it. Anyway, this starts a cat fight. Galadriel gets thrown into prison. She's not very wise, which is sort of her thing in the book. So I think that's one of the things that many people dislike because she's so different in this show than in the books. I've seen a ton of comments defending her character, talking about how it's part of her character arc and character development, and that she will eventually become the wise ruler we know. 
But there's a huge problem with that, at least lore-wise. She was already a wise ruler in the Second Age, and in the First Age, she spent a great deal of time with Melian in Doriath. In fact, she learned a ton of things from her, so lore-wise, there's no excuse to turn Galadriel into this hot-headed Karen. I guess what baffles me the most is how anyone can actually like this character. And we're back with Isildur on a ship. Once again, we hear the whisper from a woman. I got no clue who this is, maybe his dead mother. It seems to be related to his desire to go to the western side of Numenor, so it seems plausible. Isildur and his friends are dismissed from the Sea Guard. Isildur made a mistake on purpose, but didn't expect his friends would be dismissed as well. Alright then. And then there's a bit of a beef between Isildur and his friend Valandil. Valandil brings up his dead mother, and that makes Isildur snap. I think it was a fine little drama between friends. I'm still not sure why it's so important, but I guess we will learn more about his mother in the coming episodes, and they will likely reconcile and become friends again. It's interesting that he is called Valandil. As I've said before, I guess this is because Isildur's youngest son is also called Valandil. Maybe this character will actually save his life. We will see. And then we're back with Arondir. I will say there's a bit too many characters, too many places, but we will get back to that in the end. Oh, and by the way, remember to turn on captions, because the best jokes are actually hidden down there. We finally get to meet Adar. I think he looks alright, and he seems interesting enough at least. I do hope he's not Galadriel's evil brother or something, as some leaks have claimed, but he is clearly an elf of some sort. Okay, so Arandia says he's from Beleriand. So, they are allowed to mention Beleriand in the show, but not actually show it on a map, apparently. It's a really weird answer to give. It's a huge region after all. It's basically like saying I'm from Europe. Just really weird, but alright. And we have this piece of dialogue, where Eddar wants to become a god apparently. He's obviously referring to the Valar, but if he is indeed an elf, he would just say the Valar and not gods. Especially when speaking to another elf. Gods is actually used a little in Tolkien's works, but it's more of a simple way to refer to the Valar. I do think it makes sense to use the word in this context, just so viewers understand it better. But yeah, law wise, I wouldn't do it. Anyway, Adar wants Arondir to deliver a message to the people of the Southlands, that have fled to Osterith, the elven watchtower we saw in episode 1. And then we cut to that location, of course. So they're running out of supplies, which is incredibly fast. Apparently nobody thought to bring food with them. And now even more villagers are showing up, who didn't bring any food, of course. I'm not really sure what these people are planning to do. If we look at the map, it becomes very clear that they are pushed into a corner. So I will probably just leave Mordor, sorry, the Southlands. There's no way they can live there forever. And they got no allies coming to save them, at least not to their knowledge. And some people are allowed to go hunting, but no one is allowed to go to the village. I'm sorry, but Tyrone's acting as Theo is pretty bad. Of course, he's a young actor and all that, but his acting in this scene just ruined it for me. Anyway, speaking of Theo, it feels a bit cheap story-wise to have Theo go grab food in the village. I feel it could have been done in many other ways, but let's just roll with it and acknowledge that everyone else at the watchtower would rather starve than go back and grab some food, which they actually left behind for some reason. I just find that so unlikely, and it just sort of proves that the writing isn't that good. Theo and his friend Rowan arrive at the village. I'm not sure why the orcs didn't bother to eat these sheep, but they ate this cow at least. Hickey eaters, I guess. Theo wants to search the tavern, and Rowan bails him pretty quickly, and flees back to Ostirith. And then an orc attack Theo. Yet yeah, this is Jet Brophy again. And I feel his acting in this scene is a bit over the top, but alright. Theo stabs himself with the sword, so it reforges itself, or something. There's a tiny fight scene. Theo flees outside and hides in a well. The orc, apparently named Wrath, accidentally pushes the bucket into the well. Theo groans as it hits him in the head. The orc obviously hears him, but when he looks, he isn't there. Of course. Now, instead of just waiting around to see if there's anything down there, he just walks away pretty quickly. That's just very cheesy and bad writing, if you ask me. And in the next scene, we are in Eregion again. Kilobrimbor's tower is being built. A surprising lot of it, actually. Didn't only three days pass or something. Maybe a week. And I have another issue with this. It didn't take a lot of effort to get the dwarves and elves to work together. I mean, in a previous episode they said it would be the achievement of an age. Everything seems a bit too easy for so many characters. Oh, and here's another thing. 
This looks very inspired by the architecture of the elves, but wasn't it the dwarves that was meant to build the tower? So why would it look like this? I'm sorry, but that doesn't make sense to me. <sighs> At least we finally get some pretty cool lore references to Earendil. Thumbs up for that. Kelbrimbo mentions he once told him that one day Kelbrimbo's future would be in the hands of Elrond and Elros. That's a bit weird, but alright. The scene overall is fine, but I found the ending a bit weird. Avoiding Kelbrimbo, he's not even in the same place. Feels weird and a cheap way to saying he's hiding something. Then Elrond teleports to Casa Doom and speaks with Disa. I thought she was alright in episode 2, but her laugh and her anti-mansplaining dialogue made me dislike her a little. And she just went from a scene lying to Elrond, and then immediately we cut to a scene where she talks with Durin, out in the open of course. It feels like there's a scene missing or something. Elrond is standing nearby, very predictable, and uses his elf senses to listen to the conversation. It's fine to finally use Elrond's elf senses, but it also undermines the other elves. I mean, in the last episode, an entire group of elves failed to see an entire forest being cut down, and the longest trench in the history of Middle-earth. How could they not see this? By the way, where are they putting all the dirt they're removing? Are they building a second Mount Doom somewhere? Anyway, Elrond goes to the old mine beneath Lake Miramir. Apparently Elrond knows the secret password, because Durin's children said it out loud in the other scene. <sighs> yeah, no comment on that. And yes, you guessed it. Mithril. I got no clue why they're not mining this Mithril. It's easy to get. I bet the showrunners have never played Minecraft. I think it's fine they give the dwarves their own word for Mithril, though it was secret in the lore. Still, fine with me. Then Durin wants Elrond to swear an oath. Now, that is something I find very unlikely Elrond would do. Let's not forget what the oath of Feanor led to. Let's not forget Elrond's dialogue from when the Fellowship sets out from Rivendell. Feel free to pause here. So I find it a little unlikely which were an oath so easily. But alright then, let's just ignore that. Then another problem. Durin wants Mithril to be secret, but at the same time he gives some Mithril to Elrond. While it doesn't make any sense, I feel it's a neat little reference to when Thorin gave a Mithril vest to Bilbo. And then the mine collapse, as they just stand there. I guess we all know that a Balrog will be unleashed in this season. I think we might see it in episode 7 if I had to guess. And we are back on Numenor. The mine is seen between Kemen and Eärendil again. They are obviously going with some romance between these two characters. But I guess it will be tragic and probably why Kemen will accept a ring. We'll see. And we are in prison with Galadriel and Helbrand again. It sounds even more likely now that Helbrand is indeed Sauron in disguise. At this point I would be even more surprised if he isn't Sauron. And then Galadriel gets very upset because she's compared to a horse. Yeah, the writing in this show is golden. Anyway, Farrison and Folkart show up to escort Galadriel to the docks and sail her back to Middle-earth. And you can probably guess what happens next. She overpowers four guards in an instance and throws them into a cell. I have to ask, how did they manage to throw her into a cell in the first place? How many men did it take? She's so powerful. Did she go willingly? After screaming, there's a tempest in her. It makes absolutely no sense. Sorry, but it really doesn't. Not to mention, these guards just opened the cell door. Did they lose their keys or something? What's the point? Then we get this short scene with Isildur and Arian speaking together again. I assume Arian is on the western half of Numenor and why Isildur wants to go there. They hear that Galadriel has escaped and then we cut to this. Galadriel going full Assassin's Creed again, climbing the tallest tower on Numenor, while wearing a dress of course. Everything is a bit too easy for her character. Whenever she wants something, she just gets it immediately. There are no real setbacks and no real obstacles. We see Tar Palantir for the first time, retired Santa Claus I guess, apparently he's very sick. We get a bit of history of him, and all seems alright law wise at least, to some extent. He was never thrown down from the throne of course, I've already mentioned this. They don't really explain why people rebelled against him, in the law it's just stated that there was a civil war. We never really get to know in the show why they hate the elves. I have heard some people claim that Amazon don't have the rights to tell what the Numenorians really decide which is mortality like the elves have, but that's not actually true. If we look in Appendix A, the Lord of the Rings, under the Numenorean kings, later when they became powerful, they begrudged the choice of their forefather. 
desiring the immortality within the life of the world that was the fate of the Eldar and murmuring against the ban. Anyway, let's move on. Look, Narsil, I guess we all know who will wield that later on. It's a bit different, of course, but still very similar. We also see this axe, most likely Drambolek, the axe of Tuor that became an heirloom in Numenor, and Tuor's sworn shield, so yeah, seems like a bit of a hidden law in the background. And then Muriel reveals a Palantir. <sighs> okay, so they are totally butchering the history of the Palantiri by saying there were only seven, and now only one remains. Most Tolkien fans know very well that Elendil and his sons brought seven seeing stones to Middle-earth, but apparently this must be the one in Ortang we see in the Lord of the Rings, I guess. There's another issue. Those seven seeing stones were given to Amandil, Elendil's father, because he was leader of the faithful. The text does actually open up for the possibility that there might have been more than seven Palantiri, so it could have been defended in that way, that there perhaps could have been one in Amelilos, but I can see they have decided to just butcher the law as always. Let me know if you want me to make a video about it. I am sort of planning to do it. There's just a ton of videos on my to-do list at this point. But let me know in the comments. Galadriel also claims she has touched Palantiri before. Of course she has. I mean, law-wise, it is plausible, as it's believed they were created by Feanor in Valinor long, long ago. And we know of the Master Stone in the Tower of Avalon. The problem with this is that Galadriel really hated Feanor. So I don't know why she would use that one. It's plausible, but I find it very unlikely. Galadriel touches the Palantir and also sees into the future and how Numenor is sinking. Some might claim that the Palantiri couldn't see into the future, law-wise, but a very powerful individual could actually do that. It does make sense that Galadriel would be able to use it in that way. I think it's more debatable if Muriel qualifies as a powerful individual, but in this show, they are, of course, both incredibly powerful women. And we're back with Theo still hiding in the well. Yeah, he's been there for several hours somehow, and it's in the middle of the night. For some reason, he suddenly thinks it's a good idea to flee. And we finally get a bit of interesting cinematography. We have this very long shot where we follow Theo hiding from the orcs. It looks like it's not clipping, but it might be here and there, like we know from Birdman. Anyway, good stuff. It's very predictable what happens next, and it seems to happen a lot in this episode. York shows up, and is about to cut off Theo's arm. But then Arondia saves him in the last second. <sighs> More predictable stuff. I have to ask, where did he get the sword, a bow, and those arrows from? Did Adar give it back to him? It doesn't make any sense. And then Arondia grabs an arrow mid-air in slow motion. Just like we saw in a thousand trailers by now. I'm still not a fan of these over-the-top action moments, but I guess some people just love that stuff. It's all a very long slow motion scene, the orcs are chasing after them and Bronwyn shows up. I got no clue how she knew they were there in the forest, but alright then. And there's some very loud dramatic music playing, but I don't really care enough about the characters, so I just find it a bit laughable. I'm meant to like them, or be worried about them. We all know none of them are going to die in this scene, so it just seems a bit too much for me. They get out of the woods and the sun rises. The orcs can chase after them, which of course is ridiculous. They don't like sunlight, but they are not vampires like you showed in the last episode. And speaking of the last episode, we did actually see orc archers out in the open, so I don't really follow the logic here. It makes zero sense once again. And then we find out that Disa is the one who has been singing. Singing to the rocks. Yes, like she mentioned in episode 2. Still not a fan of the idea, but nice that they're trying to give the dwarves a bit of history and culture and religion. It's probably not how I would have done it, but fair enough. I must admit though, I am really starting to like the friendship between Durin and Elrond. And Elrond's speech is not only law accurate, but I actually felt something. Yet only took the show four hours. I think this is the best moment in the show so far, and it's both relatable and some decent dialogue. So that really drags up the final score for me. Durin then decides to speak with his father. We get an excellent performance by Peter Mullen as Durin III. Perfect voice for a Dwarf King, I'd say. Really great stuff and the show sort of alludes to the Durins being reincarnated. So that's nice. I guess that's the legendary axe of Durin I. But that's just a wild guess, of course. I do hope this is not meant to be the throne room. I find it a bit too small. But still, overall, it's a good scene. Arondia tells Bronwyn that Adar wants the people to swear fealty to him, 
Not that interesting, honestly. I don't know really why they had to send a Rondir to deliver the message. They could probably just send an Orc, but plot armor. World Director Tavern Owner is apparently not such a good guy after all, and tells Theo about Sauron. Of course, Sauron's identity was secret in the early Second Age, but this show's timeline is messed up. That's one ugly orc though. Galadriel is about to sail away from Numenor, but then the tree Nimloth starts losing its leaves. We then cut to Muriel holding a speech to the Numenorians about going back to their old ways and welcome back the elves, or something like that. It didn't really make a lot of sense to me, nor why the people so willingly changed their mind. Muriel have decided to go with Galadriel to Middle-earth and fight for the people of the Southlands. It all happens very fast, and I don't really find it believable, to be honest. And the episode ends with Isildur and his friends signing up to serve Muriel in this expedition to Middle-earth. Am I excited for the next episode? Not really. Let's hand out some points. Story. 4 out of 10. I think the story overall is still very slow, and it gets boring. Characters are all over the place, and the progression of time is nowhere to be found in this show. Characters basically just teleport around. I would say it was easier for me to get through this episode. There were at least a couple of scenes I liked, but there's still a ton of stuff that doesn't make sense. I just leave plot holes. Law. 2 out of 10. When it comes to the law, there wasn't a lot to take from episode 4. There's a bit about an deal, and of course we saw Mithril. The stuff about Tau Palantir was alright, with some changes of course. There's also the weapons. That was a nice nod to the law, but easily missed. As always, there's a lot of stuff wrong, so it's a generous two. Cinematography. 5 out of 10. The one-shot scene with Theo really drags up the score. The rest of the episode didn't really impress me too much. Most of it was alright, but still some annoying slow motion. Not as bad as the last episode, of course. There were some better transitions between scenes, but it was also very weird at times. Visuals. 6 out of 10. I think the downfall of Numenor was fine, and there was also a few things here and there that was okay. Something is still missing for me though. Dialogue. 3.5 out of 10. We are back with a ton of bad dialogue. The Tempest line was probably the worst. I did like the dialogue with Elrond and Durin, and I think there were a few good moments here and there as well. I can't really give the dialogue a higher score than this though. Acting. 5 out of 10. Peter Mullen as Durin III was the best in my opinion. I also liked Adar, Elendil and Ilron. They all did a good job. Still really dislike Galadriel and Miriel. They are very much alike and they are just very stone-faced both of them. I think Ayarian and Kemen was also alright. I feel there was more romance between them than between Arondir and Bronwyn. But maybe that's just me. There were also some low points. I was a bit disappointed with Jet Brophy and Tyrone playing Theo didn't convince me either. Deezer was also off-putting at times, but she also had her moments. I think it's a generous 5, and mainly thanks to Peter Mullen. Costumes, 7 out of 10. I think we have seen some of the worst costumes in the show so far, so perhaps I'm getting used to it. Still, I feel many of the costumes were alright, the orcs looked fine, though I'm not a fan of their clothes. Adar Scar was also fine, I'm not a fan of the costumes for the Numenorians. I really liked Narsil, Drambolek, and all the other weapons from the lore we saw briefly. So they drag up the score a little. Music and sounds. 4 out of 10. In this episode, I wasn't too impressed with the music. The sounds were fine though. I guess we might have heard the Balrog amidst the mind collapsing. The overdramatic music with the slow motion was something I really noticed. It didn't move me, but just sort of annoyed me, as it felt forced to me that I had to care or feel in a certain way. So that's why I'm giving a lower score for this. And let's get to the final score. At first glance, I felt the writing was getting better, but it still had a lot of weak points. And as I was making this review, I just started to notice even more mistakes. I still think the show suffers from slow pacing, too many characters, too many places all at once. The feeling of time passing is also very off for me, which I hope this review also highlights. But I will say that at least we heard the name of a ton of characters. So in that regard, it has improved a lot from the previous episode. I honestly feel I would rank the show higher if it hadn't been for Galadriel. She's just a terrible character. And the same goes for the Harfords. It was a great relief for me that they wasn't there to drag down the story this time. My final score for this episode is 5 out of 10. I think that's very generous. There was a lot of bad stuff, 
but for the first time in these episodes, there were actually some moments I liked. So those dragged up the episode at least. Will the future episodes be as good as this one? Or perhaps even better? Well, I have some serious doubts. But let me know what you thought about the episode down below. If you liked the review, feel free to leave a like and subscribe. I use the super thanks function. If you want to know what happened to the dwarves of Thornish Company after The Hobbit, maybe this video might interest you. As always, thank you all so much for watching and farewell till next time.